Hello and welcome to the Spokane County Spotlight. I am Spokane County Commissioner Al French and my guest today is Larry Crowder, Chief Executive Officer for the Spokane International Airport. Larry, welcome to today's program. Thank you for having me on the program, Commissioner. So Larry, uh, to start us out today, could you give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself and tell us about the journey that led you to be uh, our CEO at Spokane International Airport? Happy to do that, sir. Um, this is my 35th year in the airport management industry and uh, the airport management really satisfied um, my desire to work in public service but also a love of aviation and and so combining those that's uh, turned out to be a wonderful career um, I worked in Ohio and Pennsylvania before I was recruited uh, and to have the privilege to come and serve uh, the people of Spokane County as the airport CEO well, and, and uh, I don't want to uh, miss the opportunity to also share with our viewers that you just finished a one-year tour as the president of the American Association of Airport Executives. So that is the top of the ladder in terms of airport executives. And uh, we are so lucky to have you here in Spokane. So well, thank congratulations you. on your service. and. Uh, and a great accomplishment. It was a very wonderful year, challenging to represent 9,000 members across the United States, mm -hmm. but also really a great opportunity to fly our flag in Spokane and uh, to be able to showcase the excellence of the team uh, that we have from the commissioners, the city council, the board, and our staff. So for many of our viewers who may be new to the area, could you give us a little bit of an overview of the Spokane International Airport organization? Absolutely. Um, it's very interesting because it kind of breaks down into three kind of separate areas that we manage. Um, everyone is mostly familiar with Spokane International Airport, but what might surprise people is that it's 6,400 acres in size, mm -hmm. um, and we've planned it well in order to have plenty of room to expand well into the future. Um, there is also a business park uh, that is associated with Spokane International Airport uh, that we operate, and then also Feltz Field, a general aviation reliever airport, about 400 acres in size, uh, that's located right on the eastern edge of the city of Spokane and the western edge of Spokane Valley. So a lot of area dedicated to the uh, aerospace sector. So how many nonstop destinations are offered at the airport now? Right now, we have 18 nonstop destinations that are provided by six major carriers. And then obviously, we also have uh, excellent air cargo service provided by three major air carriers. So uh, the, the one thing that we benefit, and this is because of your expertise and your relationships, is we've got more nonstops and more um, uh, air uh, airline providers here than we've ever had in the history of the county and stuff. So that's a direct result of your leadership. Well, we stay in front of the airlines a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we go to the annual speed dating events that we mm -hmm. talk about um, yeah. and then also headquarters visits. Um, in fact, one of our team is now uh, meeting with uh, an airline that currently serves the airport, just doing check-ins and figuring out where can we go next uh, with them in terms of their corporate strategy. So we are very active in that space um, and always looking uh, to increase service and uh, obviously to retain what we have. Uh, but on a seats per capita basis, uh, we lead all of the peer communities. Mm -hmm. So how many passengers flew through the airport uh, this last year? About 3.9 million total wow. passengers. Um, and it's amazing how fast things have come back um, following the pandemic. And uh, many uh, aviation economists had us expecting maybe a five year recovery period. Uh, but our area showed a much higher propensity to travel, I think, than other areas of the country. And so our, our, uh, our, our passengers have come roaring back. It's been great. So how's this compared to previous years in terms of volume through the airport? Well, uh, we had been setting records in 2019. Um, obviously, we had about 4.1 million total passengers come through. Uh, 2018 was a record year before that. So really, if you look at 2022, we were up about 21% over the pre-2020 uh, pre, uh, levels. Mm -hmm. And then uh, last year, we uh, were just about 2.9% below our 2019 record. And this year, uh, with all indications, are that we will set another record this year, beating 2019 results. Well, the projections are that this summer is gonna be a heavy 
traffic. I just read an article in the paper this morning talking about how TSA is working to try and keep up with the additional demand. So uh, kudos to you to be able to move this kind of volume through the airport. So uh, with the passenger traffic returning to pre-pandemic levels and expected to continue to increase, uh, the airport has been developing plans to expand and monetize uh, the terminal facility. So these efforts have led to the Terminal Renovation and Expansion Program, which has become known as TREX. You want to talk a little bit about TREX? Absolutely. Uh, we've been in the planning stages um, with TREX, and as an airport board member, you've been an integral part of that, mm -hmm. um, and looking at what was the right timing for TREX and making sure that we had a very solid plan of finance as well as a really good phasing plan because obviously we want to be able to do the project with as minimal disruption as possible um, and maximizing on the financial side, maximizing the grant funds available. So the idea behind TREX is really to uh, take the two terminal buildings and ultimately mm -hmm. make them into one functional facility. Um, and we'll be doing that uh, by adding three gates off the end of the sea concourse now, coming back over the area that we affectionately call the ground hold room or the cattle room uh, mm -hmm. that Alaska uh, operates and eliminating that and building three additional gates on the east end of the facility. So all the gates in total will have nine gates at the concourse C um, building and it will all be at the second level. So they'll all be on the same level, much easier to uh, for having folks navigate um, and also easier to operate those gates on what we call a common use basis. And obviously we'll have new concession spaces, uh, restrooms, um, all kinds of amenities for passengers that I think will really provide a first class um, image um, and experience for people coming in and out of our community. So what are some of the highlights of the Concourse C expansion project? You touched on a couple of them there just for, uh, momentarily, but anything else I, that we I can look toward? I think what people will notice uh, right off the bat is <clears throat> that we will have a different kind of concessions program. So the, as an example, we will expect to have like a, a bar facility that will be located very conveniently in the hold rooms, very similar to some other airports that people transit through. Um, and so we'll be modernizing around those concepts and bringing things out to people instead mm -hmm. of kind of the traditional way that uh, we've serviced the customers with food and beverage. So I'm excited about that. We're also looking to add other amenities, particularly around uh, elder care, um, and around people traveling with disabilities. One of the great things about technology is that more people with disabilities can travel now, and we are looking at ways to make sure that their journey is really um, world-class. So can you speak for a moment about the economic impact of TREX and what's expected uh, uh, for this region? Well, the project in and of itself is going to cost about $150 million, at least this phase. We have a whole other phase that we're working on, obviously working towards now that's in the design process, and we hope to be able to um, extend the program into that. But the, the economic impact alone of TREX in the community is over $300 million. Uh, and that's direct and indirect. And so we're putting a lot of people to work in the construction mm -hmm. trades, buying lots of concrete, steel, um, and piping, and all of the things that go in that are, are supplied locally, um, and then systems that go along with that. So that dollar is circulating through the community um, in, at multiple levels. And so that multiplier effect um, is mm -hmm. very beneficial for businesses in the community and keeping our friends and neighbors employed. Yeah. So uh, what kind of new amenities can travelers expect when the TREX project is complete? Well, I think one of the first things travelers, travelers will appreciate um, is that the terminal is going to be very easy to move around. And we're doing really thoughtful things like not having a curb at um, the, the roadway uh, that comes in and basically no curb so that that transition is easy to make um, and and just making sure that people um, the wayfinding is really good lots of natural light uh, into the building so they're going to have a very pleasant experience as they walk through the building the finishes are going to be really um, exciting for people to see and we're going to do some storytelling um, as well um, uh, with the architecture um, and so as 
someone goes through the terminal, they're going to be able to learn a little bit about the history of our region, which I'm really excited about, and, and uh, other opportunities to integrate art uh, from the community as well. And so I think they're going to have a really good experience. The materials that we're going to be using uh, are going to be very durable, uh, but also very attractive. Uh, we're going to have electrochromatic windows, and so the glazing will be controlled so that we let the right amount of sunlight in um, at the right amount of times. The lighting is going to be amazing, uh, and I think people are going to feel very comfortable um, in, in the terminal. New restroom facilities um, as well, and again, we talked about earlier the concessions mm -hmm. program uh, and the remake of the concessions and reimagining concessions with our goal of bringing in uh, more local uh, flair into those concession, the food and beverage side. Well, one of the things that you've really focused on with your leadership is uh, uh, it's all about customer uh, customer service and that customer experience. And you know, as, as you've said many times, uh, the airport is the front door for the community, and so it's got to be not only welcoming, but it's also got to be convenient, and efficient, and and uh, you do a great job of that. And I, I'm I'm always uh, pleased to see the. Uh, uh, comments that come in either by email or, or you know, sometimes verbally about how much they enjoyed the experience at the airport and, and what you do for the holidays is just incredible. So Thank you, uh, you do a, a fantastic fun. job. But geez, all of this costs money and stuff. So funding for these projects comes from a variety of different sources. Can you share with us how the airport is financing this project? Yes. Um, and what's really interesting about how we're financing the project is how great our timing was um, in terms of having the project ready to go at the same time that Congress passed the bipartisan infrastructure law. And we were able, through our legislative advocacy, to create specialized programs that make money available just for airport terminal projects at different size of hubs across the country. So we are no longer competing with SeaTac, as an example, for the same amount of money, for the same pot of money. We have our own set aside for airports our size that we get to compete in for that. And we've done very well. So the timing of that is, has been absolutely perfect. Uh, but as an example, there's two types of programs in the infrastructure law. One is a formula program uh, that we'll have up to $32 million for. Another is a discretionary grant program. Uh, in the first two rounds, uh, we've won a total of $26 million in that program. And that is a great credit to our legislative delegation at the federal level and the advocacy that they uh, bring to our project. But um, on top of that, we are actually able to flex some CARES Act money that we received into the project, um, as well as working with the county to um, execute short-term loans that actually really help provide that bridge financing for us and will push off the need to actually sell uh, airport revenue bonds in the future. But we expect to sell some, some airport revenue bonds, maybe in the $80 million range um, or more, depending on if we move into that second phase of TREX. But I think the key for viewers to know is that every dollar of grant money that we bring in actually saves us $2 because that's money that we don't have to finance. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can maximize and take advantage of the grant programs, the better better off we're going to be and we'll be able to obviously do more. Well, and that's that's one of those uh, elements about um, uh, your leadership that has, uh, I think in the, the term that you've been here, uh, I, I was going through here uh, a couple of weeks ago and could identify almost $200 million worth of grant money and other investments that have been made at the airport that uh, were long overdue. I mean, uh, the, the uh, airport has stat stagnant for a long time before uh, you coming to Spokane and stuff. So, uh, and the real plus for our taxpayers is that we don't have to raise local taxes to fund any of this construction. I mean, all of this infusion of, of uh, revenue into the region is, as you say, grant money and uh, you know other partnerships and, and uh, ultimately some bond issuance. But the other thing that you've done that uh, uh, I think needs to be shared with the viewers is that in the going back to 1962, the airport had been in the process of acquiring land 
to accommodate expansion. And this is one of the things that, that we've done here at the local level that a lot of communities fail to recognize is at some point you need to be able to grow that airport and stuff. So in 2018, we uh, finalized a new revised airport master plan that set out a vision for this community for the next half a century. And so that also identified property that could be released and back out into the tax rolls. And so you've been very diligent about uh, accommodating sales of the surplus land, land that could be back on the tax rolls and facilitating the creating of new jobs and stuff. So uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, and I think the key is that uh, working together with the county, with the city, with the airport board, and our team at the staff level, we've really been focused on operating the airport as the business that it really is. Mm -hmm. And I think that that approach um, has really paid significant dividends for the community. As you point out, we do not require any taxpayer assistance mm -hmm. to operate the airport, and we throw off over $3 billion of economic benefit a year into the community. So it's a great deal. And I think that the other piece of that is, is as we grow, that provides us with more business opportunities. So we make better business deals, we increase our revenues, um, and we can execute more on the capital side by growing those revenues. The surplus land was, was long um, a, a latent um, situation for us that we had to correct. And as you pointed out, after we were able to get the new airport layout plan in place, that identified literally hundreds of acres of surplus property that we have gone out um, and begun to market. And the market has responded very favorably because as we both know, mm -hmm. the airport area is one of the fastest growing uh, industrial areas in the state of Washington, yeah. um, and that's no accident. It's because we've had a great plan and we've executed very well around that. But the key to that is is releasing this land and being able to sell it uh, at fair market value and put it back on the tax rolls and have investment in that property and the job creation that comes to it. So this whole idea of leveraging our infrastructure around transportation, um, logistics, advanced manufacturing, and aerospace is really unlocking incredible value for the community, but also incredible value for us to be able to reinvest those proceeds in better facilities for our customers. Well, and you talk about investing uh, back into the community and stuff. And so uh, recently, um, uh, the airport completed uh, construction on a rail truck transload center so what factors contributed to the airport deciding to build this facility that not only takes advantage of some of the land that you've now declared a surplus and available for uh, other economic development, but it also helps the county in terms of the county is one of the, Spokane County is one of the few counties in the state that owns its own rail line. We own the Geiger Spur rail line, and so we are trying to drive more business there, and that's exactly what the uh, uh, a rail truck uh, uh, transload facility does. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And, and I think it, what's amazing about it is that in, it really underscores the, the partnership that we now have, where the county had this asset, um, the airport had available land around it, um, and we've now put together this vision of how to maximize all of that. That rail spur is incredibly strategic. Um, and in the past, the, the county and WashDOT and the legislature had been making funding available to study the transload, uh, but it was it was looked at in a lot of other places other than on airport. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's really when uh, we broke through and the vision was to say, let's bring that on airport and let's build a world-class transload facility that leverages all of the other transportation infrastructure that is uniquely placed right in this vicinity with Spokane International Airport, Fairchild Air Force Base, three interchanges on I-90, now we have this wonderful multimodal and intermodal opportunity that brings efficiencies to the business community. And I think over time, this will go down as one of the most strategic investments in the history of Spokane County because of the ability to leverage and bring in that freight and ship it in the most efficient way possible, either by rail, by truck, 
or by air, all within this very unique area. So I think for us, um, working together, it's been a lot of fun uh, to just you know, bring that asset forward and just take advantage of that investment that the county made to maintain the Geiger Spur Rail. So I think it's gonna continue to add value along the surplus property. Definitely. And we'll be able to sell that surplus property at higher rates, which will give us again more resources to put into investment in the airport yeah. area. So it's this wonderful, you know, virtuous cycle of you know investment and job creation and creating more demand for air travel. Well, and, and you touched on a little bit there that uh, the uniqueness about the West Plains is the fact that it's one of the very few, if not only locations in the state of Washington where you do have rail, you've got air, and you've got the freeway system, uh, three of the four major transportation modes, all in one location with available land to develop. And so it's very, very unique, and we have been very opportunistic about attracting new business, which means new jobs, new economic prosperity for the region, uh, and Oh, that's right, and no tax dollars. And no, uh, tax dollars. no having, no need to raise uh, tax dollars and stuff. So, uh, a, a great strategy, and it's working. That's the, that's the incredible part of it. It's working. So, so what are some of the highlights for the Transload Center uh, that you're uh, looking forward to? Well, we offer 1.7 miles of new track, which um, joins up with the Geiger Spur. And uh, we have two loading tracks that are almost a half mile long each, as well as another running track alongside of that, and all over a little over four acres of concrete maneuvering and storage area and an access road with control facilities, security fencing, um, hooked up to Craig Road, uh, which the county is going to come and uh, build onto uh, to make truck traffic uh, and safety better in that area. So as it flows down to 902. So the, the transload facility, which is, I think, again, a world-class uh, level facility, on top of that has plenty of room for expansion. We've already been able to successfully win additional congressionally directed spending money from sure. Senator Cantwell uh, to put in additional truck crossings as well as additional money from the state legislature uh, that we can now put into a special what we call liquids handling track. Uh, and so this will be a facility that I believe truly is world class and can be expanded almost infinitely um, as we build the business around it. And, and as we've seen, um, there is uh, new industries uh, move their product in a variety of different ways. And so what you want to do is you want to have uh, um, a variety of different options available for the businesses so that you can meet their needs. Um, and, you know, whether it's uh, around the airport, you know, I, I think back on, you know, when we brought uh, Highline Grain to the, opera, uh, the area, they can uh, take uh, grain from truck to rail and then ship it to the coast and then uh, uh, overseas uh, or to other parts of the country. Um, now, next to that facility will be Louisiana Pacific with a major manufacturing facility, 80 acre manufacturing facility. Well, all of that's made possible because of access to rail and the road and the airport. And stuff. So there's a lot of great synergies that are being created, and it is making uh, this area very attractive for new business, new industry, more importantly, new jobs and economic opportunity for our taxpayers. So I'm I'm going to bet that as a CEO for an airport, you probably get this question asked a lot, and that is, what is the most valuable travel tip you can share with our viewers? Well, given the times, the most valuable travel tip I can, can provide is show up early. Mm -hmm. And if things go well, enjoy the relaxation on the other side of the screening process um, that uh, you'll have the opportunity to do by, by showing up early. As you mentioned previously, Commissioner, the, the challenge that we're dealing with right now, which is what we call a high class problem, is that the industry has come back so fast, it's really outrun uh, the staffing levels across the industry, whether that's an air traffic control, whether it's with TSA, uh, whether it's with the airlines, flight crews, flight attendants, mechanics. Um, all of that is still rebuilding. And 
yet at the same time, the passenger demand has come back so fast. Uh, that's been the, the friction point right now. And so uh, we tell people, pack a lot of patience and, uh, and try to uh, enjoy the ride um, and, and be ready for changes um, as you encounter those in the system. Well, and you talk about changes. One of the changes we've experienced just this year is that Alaska Airlines is tr tr uh, providing service to their area uh, and, and it's gotten rid of the uh, Q400, the old prop, double prop, and replaced it with, uh, with a jet airliner at uh, the E-175. And so it's quicker service to Seattle and other communities, but it's Again, it's stepping up. While other communities are fighting to hang on to what they've got, we're growing and we're getting more service for our, our and the trend. Our, and, and I think that's really great that you bring that up. And it, it goes to show the specialized knowledge that you've developed mm -hmm. by your service on the airport board because it's an entirely different industry, a lot of complexity around that. Yeah. But I think where we're headed is, is this trend of larger aircraft fewer flights, and I think that's going to be what people experience, is that with the Q400s leaving the fleet, a little less frequency than they may have enjoyed in the past, but better quality of service quality from the E-175s. Service. Larry, I have really enjoyed our conversation, and I uh, uh, think our viewers have too, but I'm afraid we have run out of time. So I would like to thank my guest, Larry Crowder, CEO of the Spokane International Airport, for joining us today. As a reminder, a video of today's spotlight can be accessed on Spokane County homepage and our Spokane County YouTube channel. I'm County Commissioner Al French. Thank you for joining us today on the Spokane County Spotlight. <laughs>